Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Since its rapid growth in the 90s, K-pop has become a multi-billion dollar industry and an integral part of South Korea's image, both domestically and abroad. In stark contrast and despite support from the South Korean government, Korean traditional music, or kugak, remains a somewhat unknown tradition in and outside Korea. How do we define Korean traditional music? What position does it hold in contemporary South Korean society? What role has the government played in its evolution since the end of the Korean War? And will kugak follow a path similar to K-pop, become a product designed for export? Or is it still a living and thriving tradition? To answer these questions, we had the pleasure of interviewing Professor Hilary Fincham Sung. Professor Fincham Sung earned her PhD in ethnomusicology from Indiana University in 2002 and is now associate professor in the Department of Korean Music at Seoul National University. She has served as the chair of the interdisciplinary major in music education at Seoul National and formerly worked as a lecturer and researcher at the University of San Francisco and UC Berkeley. She has also published in several academic journals, including Ethnomusicology, The World of Music, and The Seoul Journal of Korean Studies. Professor Fincham Song, welcome to Korea and the World. Yeah, thank you. Uh, could you tell us why you got interested in Korean traditional music in the first place, coming from Indiana? Well, I'm actually originally from Tennessee. Oh. Um, I was born in Nashville, Tennessee, and I uh, was engaged in music learning and playing for a good part of my life. And uh, when I was an undergraduate, uh, I was an anthropology, sociology major, and a music minor. I started as a music major, but changed because of uh, lots of issues related to stage fright, etc., <laughs> and stress <laughs> and competition. I was more interested and enthralled by anthro. And I went to graduate school for ethnomusicology. And as an ethnomusicologist, I sort of kept my prospects very broad as an incoming graduate student. I was very interested in uh, shamanism and music, and uh, I was very interested in the effects of music on the brain and all kinds of um, issues loosely related to shamanism and music. And uh, a professor at Indiana, I went to graduate school mm -hmm. at Indiana University, and a professor there, uh, Roger Janelli, who had been doing research on Korean folklore studies for decades at that point, suggested that I look into Korean shamanism. And I said, okay, why not? Because I've been looking at all different areas like Tuva, Mongolia, what have you. So I had no concept of what Korean music sounded like or what Korean even sounded like as a language or anything about Korea. I just didn't get that education as a, as a young person. So I just dove in head first. I went and checked out all the books I could find in the library. And uh, I also went to find CDs, but there were no recordings in the library. So I had to go purchase uh, some recordings and I found three CDs at a local bookstore. One was a pun sortie, oral narrative compilation, another one was court music, and another one was southwestern shaman music. So I listened to the last one of those first <laughs> because I was interested in shamanism. And the sound that came out of the speakers was just something that I hadn't expected. It really blew me away. As a graduate student, I had taught world music classes with a professor. I was a mm. TA. Um, and so we covered Chinese music, we covered Japanese music, but Korean music was conspicuously absent. So I had no idea what it sounded like. I just thought it would be kind of like Asian, <laughs> whatever that means. Uh, what I expected was maybe Japanese, maybe kind of like Chinese, but it was so different. The sound itself is really raw, really earthy. It intrigued me so much because it also had this improvisatory feel to it. You know, like something could happen that you don't expect. And I just fell in love from the first listening and went to school the next day. And, um, and I said, oh, I just heard this music and it blew me away. And my advisor said, well, why don't you look into maybe focusing on Korea or Korean music? Because they were so desperate for me to focus <laughs> as an MA <laughs> student. I mean, I just wanted to be free and mm. kind of follow my heart. And they were really interested in me becoming associated with a world area. Um, and um, I said, well, okay. You know, and it just kind of one thing led to another. I mean, at that point... In the 1990s, if you did research on Korea, the government was very interested in funding you. And I think still it's the case. And for me, um, it just provided many opportunities and study and to be able to engage in Korean language. And I just found so much support. Not only was I interested, but I was also given a lot of support. So it just sort of led to where I am now. 
Um, so you play the hegem as your main instrument, is well, that correct? Well, um, yeah, I have to explain a little bit about mm -hmm. that. I am an ethnomusicologist, um, so that means I study the relationship between human culture and music. You know, how people perceive musical sound, how people conceive of it, and what it means to their daily lives. And as an ethnomusicologist interested in Korea, I'm very interested in how Koreans create music, perceive it, conceive it, and promote it, and, and whatnot. So one of the methodologies in ethnomusicology is field research. You have to engage in field research in order to get firsthand knowledge of musical learning and performance, etc. And part of that is a method that we refer to as bimusicality. Now, it doesn't mean that you become completely like bilingual in a musical form, but that you try, that you try to understand the music from the inside out. Following that tradition, I took up the hegum because from the time I was a young child, I played the violin. Um, mm. And I just thought, you know, the Hagum's a bowed instrument. It's a two-string bowed fiddle. And I thought, kind of like the violin. <laughs> There's a bow. Uh, I'll learn the, the Hagum. But it's really different. <laughs> um, and it's very difficult in terms of pitch placement and whatnot. But um, I took to it immediately because I really like the sound. I think many people not, might not be familiar with how you know, kugak or Korean traditional mm. music sounds, but the instruments themselves really embrace kind of a natural, earthy tone color. And the hegum itself sounds, it's kind of nasal, it has a nasal sound quality, but it also has this very earthy, rustic sound that almost sounds like a baby crying. Mm. <laughs> um, I mean, if you were to take a negative take, a, a friend of mine who didn't like the sound said it sounded like a, a dying cat. <laughs> But in my case, I think of it as very much like a baby cry or very much like somebody who is really expressing themselves. So it's very expressive in and of itself. So I just took to it automatically, and it's been my instrument now for, for almost 17, 18 years. It's sort of an aside. I'm a theorist. Mm -hmm. First, I have to write and mm -hmm. do research. The Hagem is just part of it all. So if I am correct, you are the uh, first foreign professor of the SNU uh, Korean Music Department. Yeah. Can you maybe tell us a bit about your experience and how that has been? Well, I'm the first foreigner to ever teach in a department of Korean music, ever, not just at SNU. Mm. Um, so it's sort of a groundbreaking thing. Um, you know, Korean music, just like a lot of aspects of Korean culture, Korean history, uh, Korean art studies... They're very much tied to nationalism, and the nationalism is, in Korea is very much a blood nationalism. So it's one of those things that a lot of people believe that you have to be Korean to play Korean music, or you have to be Korean to um, speak Korean fluently, or you have to be Korean, you know, to do this or that. And um, I think a lot of those ideas are sort of fading. You know, the younger generation is a lot more open-minded. They've received a different kind of education. But still, there's sort of this idea that Korean identity is very closely tied to Korean traditional music, and it is. Uh, I'm not going to argue against that, but I don't think you necessarily have to be Korean to do it. Mm. So I think it was very groundbreaking for this department at this university to say, we're going to hire a foreigner. <laughs> we're going to hire somebody who's an ethnomusicologist who does research on Korean music uh, who can bring in a different perspective. And I think it's also tied to this contemporary push towards globalization. Mm of Korean culture and Korean music is part of that. So um, I think there were two sort of motivations for looking for somebody to come and fill this position. I was lucky enough to, to take it. <laughs> uh, maybe as a last question about you, um, can you tell us a bit about your current research, just in a nutshell, mm -hmm. what's your interest currently? Well, my interests have really evolved over the years. They've gone from looking at uh, Changjak Kugak, which is uh, newly composed music for Korean instruments, to Korean music education, but over the past two years I've been actually doing field research in Chindo, which is a small island off the southwestern coast of Korea. But I, I became interested in Chindo because I find that in Chindo especially, you have a very strong living Korean traditional music culture. There are a lot of people who just do it in their daily lives. It's not something that's separate from contemporary life in Chindo. It's very much part of it. So before we go any further, can you maybe define what kugak or Korean traditional music is? I know it's maybe a lot to ask for, but we would like to give the listeners kind of a sense of, you know, what it encompasses and what it is we're talking about when we say kugak. 
Kukak is pretty complicated to define, but in a nutshell, I would say that Kukak is music that developed over time in social contexts in both the court and aristocratic life circles and also outside of court, um, what we refer to as folk music or music of the commoners. Kukak is really a meta genre. It's this huge category. And within that, you have many different categories of music. Um, within court music, you have ritual music, and then you have aristocratic music, you have chamber music, you have secular music. And outside of that, in the folk realm, you have folk song, you have ritual music, you have instrumental music, so there's a lot there. Um, it's just music that's strongly connected to Korean history. Mm. Um, in Korean historical developments. My own personal definition of kukak includes contemporary music. Um, so new music that's being created and draws on those traditional aesthetics and um, musical idioms and concepts. To me, that's all included in the big, huge category that we call kukak. So the hegum that you play is, is part of which category? All. The hegum uh, fits in all of those. Hegum mm. has a place in court ritual music. It also has a place in folk ritual. Um, the hagem is a very adaptable, very flexible instrument. It's used in so many genres. In fact, I would say it's probably the most, one of the most widely used instruments in the Korean musical instrument menagerie. <laughs> um, it's really present in so much. Um, so kugak is at the heart of the Korean traditional culture. You mentioned yeah. yourself uh, the blood nationalism. Yeah. But at the same time, it seems kugak is somehow absent from the school curriculum, and most Koreans do not really seem to care. So how do you explain this duality between, you know, this strong part of, of, the, of what it means to be Korean, but at the same time, it's kind of relegated? Right. It is sort of ironic, isn't it? And um, just to clarify, uh, Korean music, traditional music, does have a presence in the curriculum, but it really has a short history in the contemporary national curriculum. Uh, the first national curriculum was developed in the 1950s, um, and this was after the um, curriculum that was introduced by the Japanese, and then the first kind of Korean uh, national curriculum came about, um, mid-1950s, and within that, music was compulsory which is fabulous. But one of the problems was there was nothing about Korean traditional music in that first really uh, round of music education except for like one or two pages in a textbook that said this is our traditional instrument and showed like a sanglong, which is like a mouth organ or something. So um, it wasn't a comprehensive education. Um, so you had decades in which people weren't really educated about Korean traditional music. It was Western music education in public schools. In the 1980s, that started to change when people were campaigning, saying we need more Korean traditional music education. We need So it was delegated that at that point, 30% of the textbook had to have kukak information. And with each new national curriculum revision, it's been more and more and more. Now, currently, the sixth grade textbook, I think, has 60%. Problem is really an implementation, um, because uh, the great majority of music teachers, full-time music teachers in elementary school and middle and high school, are piano majors mm -hmm. or violin majors. and. Uh, I mean, I served as the chair of the Interdisciplinary Program for Music Education here for two years, and I will say the majority of our students are Western music educated, and they all feel a little insecure about teaching Korean traditional music. So in reality, the ideals are not necessarily implemented for a variety of reasons, and one of those is teacher mm. kind of insecurity about teaching it. But it's not, I think the education system is at the heart of why Koreans and contemporary Korea don't really feel a connection to Korean traditional music, but it's not the only reason. What are the other reasons of this yeah. Western music dominance? Well, a lot of it is um, stems from the 1950s and this quest for modernization, which you've probably know much about, but this quest for modernization really associated European culture or American culture with modernity, you know? Sogujui, uh, or Westernization, mm. is sort of this concept that popped up at that time, and really there was this desire to not really be Western or be European or American, but to somehow attain that level. And anything that was traditional, you know, like traditional hat making or traditional music was given sort of a negative tint. It was considered backward, maybe even associated with superstition. Mm. And then in the 1960s and 1970s, I, I have friends who lived in Korea at that time. They said... Um, that any time you heard Korean traditional music, it was usually at a shaman ritual. And shamans have a long kind of sordid history of being uh, 
portrayed as charlatans, mm-hmm. you know, and beginning with the push for modernity in the 1960s, etc., they were also associated with superstition. And there was this anti-superstition campaign in Korea in the 1960s and 1970s. And, of course, shamanism was lumped in with that, as was Korean traditional music. So it kind of had this, it was seen as something backward and negative and... I talk to people um, who do who are professional musicians now, for example, kaigum players. Yeah, if they were young women who were enrolled in the National High School for Korean traditional music, would hide their kaigum at school because they didn't want people to see that they played the kaigum. And there was also this association that if a woman played Korean traditional music, she was somehow connected with as a gisang. There was a which is you know the courtesan. Not all gisang were pro- prostitutes. Some were fine artisans. Mm. But that's become sort of a contemporary idea that a gisang saying was a prostitute, which is not necessarily true, but not all women who are involved in arts are geesing. <laughs> but one of my professors, or a colleague here at the university, when she first started beginning the Kayagam, her mother wanted her to learn, but her mother's friends were just aghast. They said, why don't you teach her piano? Like, you know, it's the proper thing for your daughter to learn piano. And she says, no, I want her to learn the Kayagam. Her mother could see a future in which there would be government support for people who did Korean traditional music. Because this was the time during which the intangible cultural heritage Hmm. system was being created. And she could see this. She could see the future. Um, But the mother's friends were so aghast at this decision. And she says, no, my daughter will learn Kayagam. And, and she did. But the friends all said, do you want your daughter to be a key sing? They really thought that way. And so I think it's sort of a generational thing as well. Uh, younger generations don't necessarily think that way. But they are victims, I think, of a system uh, that has robbed them of a chance to learn a lot and to be comfortable with Korean traditional music and to have regular exposure to it because of societal prejudice and, and whatnot. Um, I see that it's changing. Um, but it's a slow change. Hmm. Kugak education is one of your main focuses. Yeah. Why do you find it so important to educate Koreans about traditional music, especially adults? You, you wrote a lot about that. It's crucial. Education is everything. You know, I sound like a, a PSA, uh, but it's it's really, really true. Education gives you a chance. It gives you a choice. So as a young child, if you have no chance to learn about Korean traditional music, um, when you get older, it's nothing but alien to you. It's foreign um, and it's difficult. And even the way that it's being taught now, one of the required instruments in the curriculum is something called the tanzo, which is a notched bamboo flute. It's played vertically. It is very difficult to play. I can't make a sound on this instrument. I'll have to admit it. I'm going to be honest. But it's not the easiest instrument in the world to play. And then you say, we're going to have all kids learn it because it's cheap. It's only 5,000 won to buy a little morning glory you know, Tanzo at the Mumbangu, at the little school supply store. So all kids, you know, get their little Tanzo from there, and then they try to blow on it, and they're like, ah, Sanjing Yun, Suri An Nayo. You know, they're, they can't make a sound. There's nothing coming out. Um, and the teacher's like, just do it like this. And the kids are trying. I've gone through several sessions with children and their teachers where children are crying. Mm. They say that their head's hurting. I mean, it's just not the easiest instrument to introduce Korean traditional music on. But the problem with this is, um, is kids learn this way and then they develop this concept of kugak as difficult as boring and as tedious. Even my children, I have three, and one of my sons, I was doing research on the tanzo, on uh, revised instrumentation for kugak education. And he walked into my office, and I had all the instruments on my desk. And he looked at it, and he said, uh, he looked at the recorder, he said, recorder chakan goya, tanzo napun goya. So the recorder is, is sweet or good, and the tanzo is bad. And I said, why? I said, why, did, why are you thinking that? And he said, tanzo am bulojo. So the tanzo doesn't play. <laughs> And this is my kid, you know, I'm like the big Kugat crusader, and, and my own child um, has this impression of a Korean traditional instrument, which I found very sad. So I think different ways need to be revised to introduce children to Kugak that make it fun and accessible, and that includes introducing revised instrumentation into the curriculum. There's a big resistance to that in the world of Kugak because people believe the revised instruments aren't traditional and they you know, they're not authentic. But we're talking about introducing children to this instrumentation. And if they become familiar with it, they think, oh, this is cool. I can do it. I have mastery Mm -hmm. of this. There's a concept um, called flow um, that uh, if children, they can be challenged by a task, but if they try hard enough, they can master it. And then they, they lose time. Um, being engaged in that flow of learning and you really want that when you're teaching people about something anything Uh, right now that's lacking in kugak education and we need to 
get that. We need to get that back um, so that everybody can feel excited about Kukak. And what I had said earlier, it's so important to educate people on Kukak because you need to give them a choice. If they feel like they don't know about Kukak and they don't have a connection to it, they don't really have a choice. But they grow up and they say, I don't like it. Hmm. Kukak is boring. Kukak is for old people. They really are, they don't know what they're talking about. And you've robbed them of the chance to know it, to say, I know this music upside and down, but I don't like it. <laughs> you know, that's okay. You don't have to like Kukak. But you need to be given that choice to say whether you like it or not. Um, and that's freedom. And, and what about adult education? That seems also quite important for you. I think adult education is important because it allows people to kind of explore their roots. I mean, I myself, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, where country music and old time and whatnot is really famous. But when I was a teenager, I really separated myself from that because it was so uncool. And I wanted to be a classical violinist. But as an adult, I started to play old time. I started to go back and explore bluegrass. And, and, and I love it. And it's a very important part of my identity. And I think for adults, if they weren't able to have a lot of access to Korean traditional music as a child, they can then, when they're adults, they might feel there's something lacking or they want to learn it, but they don't know how. And there are a lot of opportunities for adults to actually engage in education at the National Kugak Center and Han Yejong, the uh, Korean University of the Arts, have programs for people. And um, it allows them to understand more about Korean traditional heritage. It's not something that's funny or hokey. It's actually real beautiful music that has a very strong place in Korean history and is very strongly representative of Korean aesthetics and ideals. If people have an opportunity to learn that music and engage in it, I think it's really enriching. Let's focus now on uh, Kugak and the foreign eye. You said once in an interview that Kugak should not try to accommodate foreign audiences. They should not try to, you know, soothe the taste of new audiences. Can you maybe explain what you meant? Well, I probably said that because I, I get asked a lot, how do you think Kugak should change? I mean, literally people will ask me, how should Kugak change to appeal to international audiences? And my answer is, it shouldn't. And I'm not saying that Kugak shouldn't change. Everything changes. I mean, if something ceases to change, then it ceases to be relevant, and that's a problem, and then it'll die, or it'll become something in a museum. So it must change to remain to maintain relevancy. But what I mean by that is Kugak shouldn't be adjusted to suit an imagined audience. You know, what is this imaginary audience? What do I think they want to hear? That's what the pop industry is about. Oh, Gangnam Style was really a big hit, so now let's create a whole bunch of songs and make kooky YouTube videos and put them up. The subsequent uh, release has failed. Gangnam Style was a, was a hit because it was so different and it was so local. You know, it wasn't a very good song. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Sai. <laughs> That's my own personal opinion. As a song itself, it's meh, you know, but the video made it cool, you know, and it really was interesting and I fell in love with it because of the video. But trying to copy that and trying to create some sort of form that appeals to people outside of Korea as part of the Korean wave just doesn't work because it's not, it's not authentic. And what I mean by authentic, and that could be anything from K-pop to jazz to classical to Korean traditional music, is me as an artist creating something that I like, creating something that expresses what I'm trying to express, not what I think an imaginary audience wants to hear. That's inauthenticity, and that is just doomed to failure in my mind. Um, so there are a lot of attempts by the Korean government, actually, mm. and there have been to create K-pop style bands. So you're concerned that they're trying to either connect Kugak and K-pop, or that they're trying to somehow sanitize oh, Kugak to it's sell happening. it abroad? It's happening. It's happening. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's happening. The Korean government has spent a lot of energy in funding projects that are aimed at internationalization of Kugak. Um, you can apply for grants for your group, and you have a better chance at getting funded if you include some sort of international you know, goal or mm -hmm. a global outlook uh, for your particular project. In fact, the Ministry of 
Munwatea Kwangwangbu, the Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They created a project called the Star Making Project, and there have been a succession of teams. The first one was Surya. This is just an example of one of those projects that the government has been engaged in to promote Korea and music and to align it with K-pop which I just think is a disaster. I mean, if you have somebody who's very interested in K-pop or very interested in pop and wants to play pop on their Korean instrument, that's organic. That's natural. I think there's a young woman on, I think her name's Luna. Uh, she has YouTube videos up, um, and she plays like Jimi Hendrix, you know, on her Kayagum. But people love her, and she's good, you know, and she loves that stuff. That's what she wants to do. And then there are other people who make kind of pop style music like Kang Anil and her Hagen Plus group because she's always had an interest in that and that's her, you know, and you just feel that when you see her perform. It's not something that is being constructed for a particular audience in mind. It's her. So I think Kugak can branch out and should branch out in many different directions. There are many layers of Kugak from the more, I guess, commercially viable or Mm. more kind of popular sounding music to the very deep, dark, traditional stuff, you know. There should be many different layers for many different tastes as long as it's organic and not artificially constructed. That's my own personal opinion. Behind this uh, globalization drive, does it also tell us that maybe Kugak is now more and more performed for foreigners? I don't think it's necessarily performed for foreigners, but I think that um, the government has become very sensitive to the fact that there is an interest in Korean traditional music outside of Korea. Mm -hmm. Um, So actually ongoing for the past 20 years, almost, um, there's been a program at the National Kugak Center wherein scholars, composers, musicians can go to the National Kugak Center, stay in Korea for a week or two, learn Korean instruments and see performances and learn about Korean music theory. And it's great because these people can then go back to teach in their universities and they teach classes on Korean music, etc. When I was a PhD student, I participated in that program. Back then it was a month long, now Mm. it's two weeks. So I think that there's an understanding that there's an interest and a need to feed that interest. And so there are programs for foreigners, for non-Koreans domestically, one of those being the Yansu program at the National Kugak Center. The other ones being the the Saturday programs where foreigners for a very inexpensive price can learn uh, instruments like the Kayagum and Hegum, uh, also learn folk song, and also at the National Theater. There are Ponsorti and dance classes and at the Korea University of the Arts, there are programs, not just for foreigners, but for tamuna kajong, which is like multicultural families, mm. in order to uh, provide enriching experiences that are government subsidized, but also do, actually are very crucial in introducing Korean traditional music beyond just the Korean populations. Um, and I think that those programs aimed at international populations or maybe foreigners living in Korea are important because when people then go back, you know, if they do, to their home country, then they bring that knowledge with them and that interest, perhaps. And I think that's important. I think it's a good idea. But I don't think that, uh, I don't necessarily think that programs are necessarily put on for foreigners, but I think that there's an understanding of that interest and it's sort of kind of encouraged more of an approach directing certain performances Mm. or programs at foreigners living in Korea or people visiting Korea, etc., which I think is good. I mean, about 20 years ago when I was in Korea, nothing was in English. You know, you would go to a performance and if you didn't study Korean or if you didn't understand anything, you'd be completely lost. But nowadays when you go to some performances, there's English translations, there's, for Pansorti performances, there's subtitles. It's amazing how much it's changed and really become more internationalized, which is making it more accessible to audiences outside of Korea. And it's also kind of connected to the fact that domestic audiences, Korean domestic audiences as a whole, aren't necessarily as interested in Korean traditional arts as maybe people coming here to explore Mm. Korea and want to learn about Korean culture. Uh, So it's reflecting on that. But the interest, ironically, that is being shown to Korean traditional music outside of Korea and also by foreigners in Korea has actually spurred um, an interest that is domestic. You know, kind of, it's kind of interesting. Do you know what mm. I'm saying? Like, if something that is Korean is given attention abroad or is, you know, and provided... Koreans embrace it. Yeah, yeah then yeah. Koreans then are like, wait, hey, I didn't, you know. And mm. then, you know, it's sort of this weird thing that happens here, um, not just with Korean traditional music, with, but with other things like the Hanok and mm. uh, the Korean, Korean traditional houses and literature and whatnot. You mentioned uh, uh, the difference between low and high art, okay. which we may perhaps summarize as, you know, cultural industries versus more pure aesthetic fulfillment. Mm-hmm. Is the Korean government subsidizing Kugak to somehow bolster its position internationally in terms of high art 
and be able to sell, you know, to uh, audiences abroad something that has, you know, this, that shines, that is more advanced than, you know, K-pop or just pop culture. Yeah, I think that low and high art, these are these constructs that um, mm. allow us to understand popular culture versus, say, I guess, you know, artistic or, you know, culture that is associated with, say, the aristocracy mm. or, you know. And the way that you just now encapsulated that idea, I think, is very useful for this discussion. I think the need in Korea domestically to raise Kugak status is long-standing. It's not just something that's happening in contemporary Korea. Earlier when we were talking about the reasons behind Kugak's kind of loss of connection hmm. to contemporary Korean life has to do with some societal prejudices about um, modernity and also superstition, etc. And uh, one of the things that happened in the late 1950s, early 1960s, was the development of a conservatory approach to Korean music education. I mean, historically, if you were a court musician, you were probably born into a family of court musicians, you know, and you just sort of inherited that status. It wasn't a very high status, but you had a job. Hmm. Um, if you were somebody who performed music in the folk realm, you were either associated with a family of hereditary shamans, or you were somebody who... Uh, became a part of a performing troupe like the Sarang Pei or something and, and performed in that realm. So it was something that was kind of like an apprenticeship in a way and a lifestyle you know, that has happened from a very young age for the most part. But in contemporary Korea with this kind of importation of the Western education model, the American education model actually originally, there was in the beginning of music conservatories and that started with Western music, with like piano, violin, etc. And then the first department of Korean music was this one at Seoul National University. Um, it was established in 1959. Yehegu um, began this program. And this is when you see the beginnings of modern Korean musicology and this model of curriculum for kukak instruments. Hmm. Um, this like, what do you learn when you're a freshman? you know, sophomore. And so this curriculum was actually strongly connected w with what was being accepted by the intangible cultural heritage system. So if Sanjo, which is like a instrumental solo piece based on, you know, shamanistic, you know, me melodies, is being recognized by the government, for example, Kim Juk Pa, you know, Kaegum Sanjo, is being recognized, then that's what's being taught at the university. You must learn it because it's mm. being, you know, recognized by the government. So um, you start to see a set development of the Korean curriculum and this idea that uh, Korean music could be taught within a conservatory model. The very first Dok Chuhe or the very first solo recital that was performed was performed here um, at Seoul National University by a Kaaga major. And for her recital, she people promote their recitals by photographs. She she is shown with like this kind of 1960s style bob, you know, very modern, um, and black clothing with with pearls, not in the traditional hanbok, you know. So there's this need to kind of associate Korean traditional music performance with the stage, and Korean traditional music performance with this conservatory ideal, this kind of elite musical culture. And that's sort of been something that's been happening over the generations, actually, for Korean traditional music. So this need to kind of up the status of Korean traditional music has been a continuing part of the saga mm -hmm. of Kugak within contemporary Korea since the 1960s or 1950s. So, yes, I think that, I don't think that the government push for Kugak abroad is part of that, actually, dynamic. I don't think mm -hmm. it's a part of that pushing Kugak status as elite. I think it's more of a need for tourism dollars. It's more of a need to interest people in Korea. I think that's more the motivation. Um, but this dynamic of pushing Kugak to the level of high art has been something that's been of great concern amongst Kugak performers and, and Kugak composers, for example, and theorists for the past few decades. Hmm. Generally, would you say the government did a good job in preserving the musical heritage of Korea? Because mm -hmm. obviously when you have a, an official heritage, there's always the risk of setting that in stone and preventing it from developing organically, as you, as you said. It, yes and no. Yes. I think if the intangible cultural heritage system had not been brought into place, that some of the performance genres that we take for granted nowadays, like pansori, which is the epic you know, narrative that is mm. um, the storytelling um, tradition, or certain instrumental genres, wouldn't, wouldn't exist. I think that they would have probably disappeared or been part of some sort of really marginal performance arena. But I really think that the intangible cultural heritage system really played an integral role in ensuring the survival of certain performance genres. It gave recognition to master performers. 
and it allowed for them to teach their craft and to raise new generations of students. And it also, as I mentioned just a moment ago, led to the development of the curriculum mm-hmm. for the conservatory, you know, culture of the modern Korean university in which departments of Korean music exist. So it had that effect. On the flip side, um, you do have a system that initially at least discouraged change of any sort. For, first of all, it's very subjective. So you have these specialists who are usually folklore specialists or Korean music specialists who are given the task of going to see somebody perform, and then they decide whether this person deserves the status as, of human cultural treasure, in Gan Moon and whether their performance of this particular piece of music uh, deserves recognition and support by the government. If they succeed, then this person who has been recognized must teach this performance art to generations of young students, and it should not change. They should learn it as is, and then teach it then to a new generation of young students. Well, come on. Mm. (laughs) So while it's surviving under the system, it's also slowly dying because it's becoming just dead, you know? One of the cool things about Korean music, and this is the aristocratic tradition associated with court, but also with folk music, is that it was always changing. You learn from your teacher, you learn their style, and then you went off, and the way that you became a musician was to really come up with your own style. Um, And that was definitely a part of the Korean musicianship system for, for a long time. Um, And then the system sort of halted that. You can't change it. You're not allowed. And so you had musicians who organically knew how to improvise, who organically knew how to create um, under this new conservatory system and with the presence of the intangible heritage system, that stopped. Nowadays, it's like 2015, young students are now relearning how to improvise, relearning how to Mm -hmm. be creative, because for so long, it wasn't really allowed. But now it's being encouraged. And I think part of it is, part of that reason is, the system was successful. It worked. We no longer take Ponsorti for granted. It's everywhere. You know, it's being performed all over the place, not just in Korea, but all over the world. Um, so there's really no need to try to save it anymore because it mm. is really thriving. Um, so now we can take a different approach to Kugak. We can say, okay, we know what the traditional stuff is. We have plenty of recordings. We know what's there. We have many documents. Now we can really play with that. So now in the 21st century, you're seeing a lot of new versions of Pansori, for example, or new performance art associated so with Kugak. Related to that, um, beyond official Kugak, for yeah. lack of a, of a better word, there is a vibrant music scene of Changak Kugak, which, which Changak is, Kugak, yeah, yeah. sorry, created national music, and right. Shin Kugak, new national music. Right. So how do these musicians and, and composers juggle between what is national, what is modern, what is what is traditional? How do they deal with you know these notions of, as you mentioned, authenticity, and at mm. the same time creating something that is brand new that makes a Kugak develop itself further? Well, I think that the tradition, the idea of tradition has really changed. Um, when I first started doing field research in Korea in the 19, late 1990s, I remember that the tradition, uh, the definition of tradition was very set. You know, I remember people saying, this is traditional and this is not. And it was very kind of set. In, and this was like an older generation of scholars and musicians and whatnot. And then I came back to Korea several times over the years. But in 2005, I remember going to a performance and there was a definition of tradition. And it said, tradition is fluid. Tradition is anything that we make of it. You know, and I was like, what is this? You know, it was really different from what people had talked about in terms of tradition a decade ago. And I think a lot of that has to do with the newfound confidence that was associated with learning Kugak and being a Kugak musician and even embracing Kugak. That was due to many of the things that happened since the 1960s, the preservation system and education and more departments of Korean music and more and more students learning Korean music. It kind of built and built and built over the years. And I think that there's room for that now. I think there is pressure for young students. I mean, I'm not the kind of person who will say this is real tradition or this is authentically traditional and this is not i how can you say that Hmm. you know um but i have known young students who have been instrumentalists who have been involved in fusion groups you know groups that combine like piano guitar and maybe the hegum and the kayagum and they were involved in these projects and their professors said because they were maybe ma students or phd students and their professor said you know maybe you should quit that group and really focus more on the traditional stuff because you need to build a reputation for yourself as a serious musician so i think that in some circles amongst some musicians there's this idea that a serious musician is somebody who really understands and plays the tradition well and this is like the older repertoire but in 2015 i see a lot of young performers 
for example, one of my students or one of the students in this program, his name is Anio, um, and he's this wonderful Panzordi singer. He's just fabulous, and he's so theatrical when he sings even solo Panzordi. He just moves his body really well, and his expressions are fabulous. And but he also does Changguk, which is like a theatrical version of Panzordi. It's like musical Panzordi. Um, and I just saw a performance of him and and some other young people the other day, and they did this kind of. Uh, uh, inversion of the story of Shim Chongga, you know, old blind man Shim. And, and typically, Shim Chong, his daughter, throws herself into the sea to save her father, you know, from disaster, from financial disaster. But in this version, she they move to Hanyang, or Seoul, and she gets an arbeite, she gets a part-time job, and mm -hmm. and uh, and she meets Chunhyang there, and Hong Gil Dong. And it's like this kind of, you know, it's, you know, this very popular thing that's being done in a lot of movies about fairy tales now, where they play around with this fairy tale structure. It was being done in this Changguk. And it was really well done. The singing was fabulous. The performance was really well done. And it's something that is great. And it appeals to a variety of different audiences and at the same time there's a place for that really traditional stuff in the very same theater that I saw that Changguk um, the next day there's a performance of traditional pansori a three-hour version of the of the full story of a pansori with just the drummer and just the singer so it's fabulous that in that very same location within the space of a day there are these two very different performances that both celebrate the Korean tradition and I find that very promising and just beautiful so again, there might be people who are sticklers for this is authentic and this is not, but I, I, I find it all very exciting that so many changes are taking place because that's where you have a living tradition and that's where you have genuine music making happening and not just music for preservation's sake. <laughs> You wrote that uh, many of these uh, young composers borrow compositional techniques from Western classical pedagogy. Is that yeah. the result of their musical education? Mm -hmm. Or do you see this as a redefining their Koreanness and what traditional means, or are they just responding to market forces that, you know, people like now a different type of music, so why not combine? Well, now that it's different. There was no program in Korean traditional composition. And when this program started in 1959, uh, there were young students in the Department of Composition who were interested in composing for Korean traditional instruments, but there was no program in Korean traditional composition. There was no training in it. Mm. I have to step back a little bit in that in the folk realm, improvisation was this was the moment during which new pieces were formed. People would kind of play with what they knew and they would come up with stuff. Folk musicians were master improvisers and out of those performances you had these kind of pieces that emerged. In court or aristocratic music, you had these pieces that were written down, because there's a long history of writing this down, but you also had amateur performers who played them and played with them and put together new pieces and arranged them and rearranged them, and it was like this really kind of long history of arrangement and rearrangement. Um, so this creativity was very, very active. So I really find historically that there was a composition culture in Kugak, but it was different. It wasn't like there was a Mozart under a gas lamp, you know, or whatever. <laughs> I don't know if there was a gas lamp when Mozart was living. But it wasn't like there was a Mozart by candlelight, you know, scribbling down uh, notes on a piece of paper. It was a very different concept of composition that involved many people and it involved time. So mm -hmm. it's prolonged and also collaborative. But it wasn't until 1939 that the very first composition composed for Kugok orchestration was put on paper. So that was a big deal historically, and it's considered to be the very first piece of Changjak Kugak, you know, ever uh, performed or ever, ever put out there. Um, so it started this tradition of Changjak Kugak as being separate from traditional Kugak. So there was no training ground for people to sit down and write on a piece of paper a piece of music. Um, it didn't happen until later in like the 1970s, late 1960s. So people had to learn from what was there. So a lot of younger, early composers of Changjak Kugak were drawing on Western music compositional techniques. That's all they had, mm. you know? So a lot of that early music was very much inspired by Romantic era music from the classical tradition and also programmatic music. Um, so you can really see it developing over time. 
and there have been many different stages. In recent years, you have more composers um, who write for kugak orchestration or instruments who draw on Korean traditional genres and take those and, revi- and rearrange them. Or there's a composer who I love, his name is Won Il, um, and what he believes in is the collaborative and musician-based composition effort. So he will sit down with musicians and have them improvise. And from those improvisations, the piece will emerge. So that is how he composes. And he, and he believes that's how it was always done. And we all need to relearn how to do that, you know? So there are many methods for coming up with pieces of music nowadays. And there are many different types of new music. There's a very academic style of Korean, it's called Hyundai Kugak. A lot of people refer to it as Hyundai Kugak, which is the same as Hyundai Umak or modern music movement or the postmodernist, you know, performance movement. And there's also fusion, which is more of like a, it's more of like a popular music form with guitars and pianos and drums and whatnot combined with Korean instrumentation. There's also jazz now, jazz and, and Kugak collaborations. Um, there's a lot happening um, and it's very, it's wonderful to see the proliferation of many different forms and styles of composition that are taking place. So nowadays you still have people who draw very heavily on Western music techniques and, and maybe um, styles in composing, but then others who completely come from a different direction. So it's very diverse nowadays. Professor Fincham Song, to conclude, how can Kugak best manage this global cultural and media system we live in? Do you think Kugak needs to become more mainstream to thrive again? Or is it doing well right now? Is there a risk of maybe commodification, potentially even fetishism? We spoke of high art before. Mm. Well, um, yeah, <laughs> there's a risk of all of those things. And and um, as I mentioned earlier, with some of the projects that have been conceived of in some corners of Korean society, that yeah, commodification is an issue. And I think that commodification I tend to define as imagining an audience and writing for that audience, which I really don't find good <laughs> in my own personal opinion but then again I'm not somebody who works for the music industry and I'm not out to make a, a buck on, on recordings um, so I can understand that perspective I think that Korean music is going to keep I think it needs to happen organically I think that it shouldn't be pushed I think that some of the pushes towards globalization in contemporary Korea are, are artificially conceived You know, you can't just put something out there and expect the world to embrace it. And my own opinion of kugak is that it's a local music. It's it's naturally just a local music. It is very much reflective of a particular historical time. And the new types of music that are popping up that are kugak related are very reflective of 21st century culture and, and what kinds of music people like and what inspires them. And you see a lot of young groups who actually record alongside the sounds of the cityscape, the sound of the subway or um, the sounds of children playing outside. All that's part of the soundscape organically. And that's beautiful. It's a wonderful thing. But the danger that I had mentioned earlier is in trying to create a music that you think may appeal to people that you that don't really mm. matter to that music's development. And that's the danger that I see. I think that that's when the society would become like a spectacle of sorts. It would become quite an artifice that you want to try to avoid. I think that Korea as a, as a country is culturally part of the world global system already. We're all kind of in this together. And I think that Kugak is engaging with international community in many creative ways, like the girl who plays, the young woman who plays, you know, Led Zeppelin or mm. Jimi Hendrix on her Kayagum. There are people that, you know, I know living in Tennessee who are like, have you heard her? And they're sharing her videos with me on YouTube. And I'm like, yeah, I've heard of her. Um, so it's getting out there in, in a way that is accessible and maybe uh, accessible to audiences who might not know a lot about Korean traditional music. And if that appeals to them, they can maybe learn a little bit more about it. Or I'd like to come to Korea and take classes in the Kayagum. I think that kind of thing should happen organically. And I think it's a gradual process. And I've really seen Korean society's relationship with Korean music over the past almost 20 years that I've been doing research on Korea develop in a really interesting way. And I think it's going to continue to develop. And it's hard to predict in which direction it will go, but I see it getting stronger and stronging. The, the presence of Kugak is becoming stronger. When I first came to Korea in the 90s, people would ask me, you know, what are you doing research on? And I would say, well, I'm looking at well, Kugak, specifically Changja Kugak. And they would look at me and go, why? 
And even people who did Kugak would say, isn't it boring? Are you, really? You know, I was like, dude, you do Kugak. <laughs> How can you say that to me? Oh my God, this is terrible. You know, and this was in the 1990s. But then when I came back, you know, over the subsequent years in 2005, 2008, people would say, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm doing research on, you know, contemporary Kugak. And they would say, oh my gosh, do you know Huang Byung-gi? Or do you know Kang Anil? And this is somebody who is not even connected to the world of Kugak, who knew about a famous master musician or had somehow engaged with the tradition in some way. So it's becoming more and more and more present in Korean society and more something that is something that is proud of and people really admit that they really want to engage in. And I find that just wonderful. People didn't do that in the 90s. They were like, ugh, Kugak, what? You know, and now people are more, when I do a lecture on Kugak or if I do a performance, they'll say, gosh, I'm Korean and I don't know that much about it. This is wonderful, thank you. And they'll engage in it more. And I've had students who have taken my introduction to Korean music class who have gone and joined a dongari or a club and now they're playing, you know, the kayagam or the kamungo. And so it's really encouraging to be a part of that change. Um, and I find it very exciting. I just can't wait for the next 20 years <laughs> to see what's happening. <laughs> Professor Fin Chim Song, thank you so much for your time. It was really great talking to you. Yeah, thank you very much. The full references of the three Kugak sound bites featured in this episode are available on our website. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.